Hi. Um, I wonder, back to the, the title, uh, so I wonder why, can you summarize why the artificial intelligence approach won't work for the explanation of consciousness or Yeah, the thought, well, I didn't really get into this, uh, um, uh, but the thought behind it is that um, that art, the artificial intelligence approaches are probably better for access consciousness than phenomenal consciousness. This idea of global broadcasting um, seems more um, amenable. You know, it's information flow, basically, whereas what's going on in phenomenal consciousness seems somehow different from information flow. It seems maybe to involve, you know, biochemical mechanisms in the brain. I mean, we don't know what the nature of phenomenal consciousness is. So I guess maybe what I should really say is there is a possibility that um, information methods based on the flow of information will work for phenomenal consciousness. It is certainly true that advances to do with phenomenal consciousness seem to be coming from neuroscience rather than from computer science or artificial intelligence. You know, one of the hopes, I mean, one of the points that people have made about the global workspace viewpoint, the one I've been arguing against, is that it's in principle implementable on a machine. So people who are interested in machine consciousness have been very happy with the global workspace idea. So to the extent that I'm arguing against the global workspace idea, I'm arguing against uh, at least a standard kind of computer approach to consciousness. In your mind, can you imagine, or is it, do you believe that machines can get consciousness? Yeah, I think in the, look, I think we're conscious machines. So, I'm, you know, we're meat machines. I, I, I'm, I'm not any kind of a dualist or anything like that. Um, but I think that um, the most obvious application of theoretical approaches um, to consciousness from a machine point of view haven't panned out. Um, I, I haven't mentioned really, there's a lot of other more machine friendly approaches. So, I'm you know, some of them may, look, it depends what kind of machine we're talking about. I, my f uh, feeling is that we may need some kind of analog processes to deal with consciousness. But, you know, this is initial stages of uh, approach to it. So I'm not entirely sure how to ask this question, so bear with me, but it, it seemed like a lot of the things you were examining in terms of what constituted, you know, conscious awareness of information or conceptualization of information or, uh, you know, unconscious or preconscious conceptualization of information or recognition of information, all kind of had to do with a sense that there's sort of like like one place like where consciousness is happening, like consciousness is all kind of one singular like sort of Cartesian process. And like if that's not true, what implication would that have for these questions? You know, is it possible that these might all be irrelevant questions to consciousness overall and are merely a question of where information happens to be in the brain at any given point? Yeah, so I definitely do not think there is a place in the brain. My, one of my opponents, Daniel Dennett, has used that to caricature my position. He calls it the Cartesian theater. Um, so I think that our best guess about like where in the brain consciousness happens is that every conscious content is processed by the area that processes that kind of information. So for example, <coughs> Um, conscious um, uh, contents of um, motion have to do with uh, activations in that area MT. Probably they involve um, um, uh, reciprocal connections to lower visual areas. Conscious um, uh, appreciation of faces probably has to do with activation in this thing called the fusiform face area at the bottom of your right temporal lobe. So. I don't think there's any place where they come together. The closest thing to a place, I like to distinguish between what makes a content, um, uh, between uh, um, the difference between different conscious contents like face and, and motion. I like to distinguish that question from what makes those contents conscious, a matter that has been explored by studying, for example, anesthesia. And it looks like there's some kind of general connectivity, especially going back to this thing in the middle of the brain called the thalamus. People used to th speak of a thalamic switch. So the closest thing to like a place where it all happens might be that. But I don't think that's what explains the diff difference between consciousness of a face and consciousness of motion. It's more like a, a kind of an, a, you know, something in the direction of an on-off switch. Thank you. Hey. 
Maybe a silly question, but I noticed all of your examples in this were done with people. Yeah. What about animals? Like. Yeah. Okay, so there was a big revolution in the study of consciousness in the mid-1990s when um, uh, uh, Francis Crick, the Nobel Prize winning biologist, and Christoph Koch realized you could approach consciousness through studying animals. And a lot of the work is with animals. Uh, you know, it happened that, uh, uh, actually I skipped something that was about the involved subjects were monkeys, but a lot of the work is in animals. And uh, I think there's every reason to believe that our primate cousins um, are just as conscious as we are. Um, uh, you know, it used to be before about 20 years ago that people thought of consciousness in terms of language. And I think that access consciousness was, you know, what they had in mind. And I think one of the things that's happened in the last 20 years is people have realized that language really doesn't have much to do with it. So, yeah, there's a lot of work on consciousness with animals. Of course, it's easier to get reports from people. So, uh, um, but there's been really some surprising work with animals where um, you can really get at what they, uh, um, uh, you know, what what they're experiencing through nonverbal methods. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, if you suppose we had a synapse level uh, simulation of the full human brain, which yeah. I'd argue we might just be 15 years away from or so. Um, would this simulation exhibit phenomenal consciousness? Uh, well, that's something that people have uh, argued about. So one common point is that a simulation of a rainstorm isn't wet, and maybe a simulation of a conscious being isn't conscious either. So this all goes back to the issue, which we don't know about, but which could be true, that consciousness essentially involves something to do with the neural processes that are going on in the brain, some kind of analog thing. Um, and that uh, without an analog device of that, that sort, you're not going to get consciousness. For example, um, uh, signals in neurons are electrical, but the neurons c uh, communicate via chemicals that go across the synapse. Maybe that's part of what's needed for consciousness. Maybe if you don't have you, maybe you could make an artificial synapse. Well, people have made artificial synapses, but you, maybe you'd have to use uh, neurotransmitters for it to really have genuine consciousness. This is the thing. We don't really know what at its most basic level consciousness is, so we don't know the answer to that. Um, follow up uh, to that, to not knowing what consciousness is. Um, what attempts have been made to attack this question from the point of, instead of asking what is consciousness, asking why is consciousness, yeah. and speculating why it evolved even? Yeah. Okay, well, a lot of people have, have, have tried to, you know, to, to answer that. Of course, it's a little hard to know. If, you know look, evol evolutionary reasoning, you know, there's, it's famous for the so-called you know, just so stories, uh, in, uh, to use uh, Stephen Jay Gould's phrase. Um, but there are, there are all sorts of hypotheses um, about you know, why we have consciousness. It's obviously doing something for us. You know, um, whether, no, here are some possibilities. Maybe it's motivational. So you know, positive consciousness, pleasure, pain. Maybe it is, um, some, it's a way of organizing attention or uh, has something to do with interactions with attention. Um, so they're all, there's no shortage of speculations, but you know, it's, I don't think anybody knows. Um, could you describe again, the, the, I, I was a bit confused, the difference between uh, um, kind of conscious perception and uh, conscious perception that is not conceptualized, which is basically the thing where and also, once you do that, uh, discuss a bit kind of the consequences, like what, what would that mean yeah. if one theory is still versus the other? OK, so a good um, uh, index of this is the uh, uh, baby's perception of color. OK, so you've got this six-month-old baby. Its color discriminations are uh, almost at the level of, a, uh, of an adult. Um, and the way you can tell that, for example, is if you have a, 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 um, a, a colored background and a, a, a different colored disc, a baby looking at that or an, and an adult looking at that will tend to move their eyes to the disc if they can see the difference. So that is an, gives you an, 
That's one method. There's a number of methods of finding this out. That's one method that tells you that babies distinguish between colors pretty much the way we do after about six, four to six months. However, they cannot use colors in reasoning. So here's an example experiment. Um, if uh, babies are very interested in movement and noise, if you um, uh, uh, and you can. Uh, uh, they can so you, uh, a display. This is uh, done by Jean Remy Hochmann. You have a display where a wonderful noisy puppet thing that twirls around will either occur on the left or the right. If you see two identical shapes, then you can set it up so that it's on the left, and the baby will notice that regularity. And two identical shapes, look at the left because there's going to be something great there. What about two identical colors? on the left. They can't do it. They can't. They don't register colors in a way that allows them to use them in reasoning. So that's what concepts are about. They're about reasoning and thinking and decision making and evaluating. They just can't do it. So, um, and in fact, babies don't even learn the four basic color words until they're three years, three months old. Um, an experiment done by, Michael, by Mabel Rice in the 1980s took kids who did not know the difference between red and green, uh, did not, sorry, did not know the words for red and green and tried to teach them the words red and green. This is three-year-olds. She had to go through a thousand trials to get kids to, to um, uh, learn the red-green contrast. The typical thing is once they learn one color and word, they learn them all because, you know, there's, there's been a lot of experimental work on this. But basically, what we're dealing with is a creature, namely the human baby, that does not register color in a way that allows them to conceptualize it. It's non-conceptual. And I think all perception is like that. It's that its most fundamental level, it's non-conceptual. It, 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 sometimes they're automatically conceptualized and it gets into our conceptual system. But what you have to realize is the perceptual and the, and the cognitive are just different in the human brain. Now, maybe that doesn't have to be true in the machine brain, but you know, we would be wise to give a thought to how people work when we're thinking about how to get machines to work. So that's the, that's the reason it's relevant. One way, or one thing that comes to mind here is maybe another terminology difference between these two things that might be useful is um, conceptual is sort of like symbolic reasoning, symbolic process yeah. processing, like you would do in like logical formulae or something. Yeah. Whereas like the other type of processing that you're considering is more like, say, a digital signal processor that translates audio data to digital yeah. data. Mm -hmm. It's not and doing symbolic reasoning there. It's doing, applying just some kind of fixed transformations. And yeah. that seems to be the site of phenomenal character in your view. Yeah. That then gets brought up into this sort of symbolic central unit. Yeah, that's, I, I, yeah, I accept that. Yeah, good. Are any of these points do all, does all of this make sense still if you are a dualist? Ah, OK. Yeah. Um, I think everything I've said could be accepted by a dualist. Um, maybe, um, well, maybe not. You know, I did say some things that sounded like I think there's a neural basis. But even dualists can accept a neural basis for conscious experience. So yeah, I think everything I said could be, could be thought of, could be accepted by a dualist. So the question is whether that neural basis is really all there is to it or not. OK. Thank you. That's, uh, that's it for questions. And let's thank Ned again. Thank you.